when my parents were divorced. I would spend six months with my father in New York and six months with my mother in, in, in Los Angeles. And uh, all this time accompanied by Virginia, my, my uh, nanny, my governess, whatever you want to call her. Now, if you're two years old, three years old, four years old, and you spend four days on a train looking out the window at cowboy country and you know, hearing this tick, 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 you, it really makes an impression. Now, don't ask me, God knows, somehow these train trips I took as a child popped into my head. And I began to think back, well, let's see, what years did I do this? 37, 38, 1939, 40, what was going on in the world then? Well, we all know what was going on in the world then, that Mr. Hitler was getting ready to take over the world and killing every Jew he could get his hands on. If I had been born in Stuttgart or Brussels, uh, as opposed to being born in New York, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So the light went on in my head, wow, different trains. In the groundbreaking Different Trains, Reich turned to new technology in the form of the keyboard sampler to build a work around the recorded voices of people from his childhood and Holocaust survivors. It was a development of his earlier idea of using speech as a musical device. When Virginia, my governess, speaks, as she speaks, so I will write. Her first words are, from Chicago, um, ba -dee -dum. and so the strings play, dum, ba -dee -dum, ba -dee -dum. and then she comes in, from Chicago. The rule was, as they speak, so I write. Every time a woman speaks, the viola will double her. Every time a man speaks, the cello will double him. I uh, said, okay, the violins will become the, the train whistles. So you have these long held tones and the fiddle. And again, you have a mix so that the, the sound of the violin, the sound of the train whistle are just sort of blended. So the documentary reality and the musical reality become one and the same. And I don't have to try to express the angst of, of the Holocaust, which is impossible to do. I could simply have people talk about their own lives. It has this way of seizing an idea and shaking it about and making of it something that, that no other composer has made and any composer that, that does the same thing is just a kind of cheap imitator. During the 1990s, Steve Reich's music found a new and unexpected audience. In 1992, I was in London and being interviewed by one of those pop keyboard type magazines, and they said, what do you think of the orb? And I said, what's the orb? They said, you don't know? I said, no. They said, well, you ought to know, and they gave me this CD. And I took it back, listened to it, and there, in little fluffy clouds, the first tune is 30 seconds of Electric Counterpoint, the piece I wrote for Pat Metheny.
So I thought, well, wow, these people don't just like what I do, they take what I do. He finally found us back in 1995, 96, and he was one of the most genuine musicians we'd actually come across in the, in the OK, I found you, you owe me some money kind of scenario. Will I get the lawyers in? He didn't do that at all. He asked us to do a, a version for his album and... OK, I want a 20% cut of the, of the royalties from this point on. And we just thought, what a... Very London-like, but what a lovely geezer. Remember that I was the kid at 14 sitting in Birdland where you, in the section where you couldn't have a drink listening to Miles Davis and the drummer Kenny Clark and wishing I could be Kenny Clark. It feels very good to see sort of a replay of your own life with, with you on the stand and them in the audience and it feels like a kind of, you know, poetic justice. Wright and the various others were quite aware of Afro-American traditions and African traditions, and that rhythmic sense infused their music. It's because of those two things, a shared rhythmic and a harmonic sense, that, which gave rise to on the one hand pop music and on the other hand to the new tonalism that's why those two musics are quite happy with each other they're friends you know they they share the same grandparents sort of thing his popularity on the dance scene prompted rice to commission djs to rework some of his pieces that album is a kind of interesting failure. But it actually, what it is a failure, because it shows how strong Steve's basic material is, and it isn't, uh, you know, unlike the music of some of us, it doesn't gain from being straight-jacketed into, into a kind of beatbox kind of mentality. So that, again, shows how it manages to kind of slide away from kind of conventional thinking. You're required to have an emotional response to Steve Reich's music, and that immediately takes it out of the realm of just simple background, ambient music. I think Steve Reich thinks of himself as someone who, whose music is extremely emotional, which sounds paradoxical given that a lot of it in texture is very simple. But he has said that what he wants to do is to create very personal, emotional music, sometimes out of processes which are in themselves quite impersonal, quite mechanical.